introduce our honorable speakers. Dr. Reza Aslan, an internationally acclaimed writer and scholar of religions, is the founder of AslanMedia.com, an online journal for news and entertainment about the Middle East and the world. Aslan Media is actually here in the audience today. Um, Reza Aslan has degrees in religion from Santa Clara University, Harvard University, and the University of California, Santa Barbara, as well as a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from the University of Iowa, Iowa where he was named the Truman Capote Fellow in Fiction. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Los Angeles Institute for the Humanities, and the Pacific Council on International Policy. Aslan's first book is the international bestseller, No God But God, The Origins, Evolution, and Future of Islam, which has been translated into 13 languages and named one of the top, one of the 100 most important books of the last decade. He is also author of How to Win a Cosmic War, as well as editor of the recent release, uh, Muslims and Jews in America, Commonalities, Contentions, and Complexities. His opponent, Hussein Abish, is a senior, fellow re uh, senior research fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine. <laughs> He's a regular contributor to many American and Middle Eastern publications, including the Daily Beast, Foreign Policy, The Atlantic, a monthly contributor to Al Hayat, and a weekly columnist for Now Lebanon. Ibish is a, as editor and principal author of three major studies of hate crimes and discrimination against Arab Americans between 1998 to 2007. His most recent book is What's Wrong with the One State Agenda? Why Ending the Occupation and Peace with Israel is Still a Palestinian National Goal. From 1998 to 2004, Ibish served as communications director for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, Committee. He is also a PhD in comparative literature from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And finally, our moderator, James L. Gelvin, is a faculty member for the Department of History here at UCLA. Gelvin earned his undergraduate degree from, the Col from Columbia University, graduate degree from, I'm sorry, master's degree from the School of International and Public Affairs of Columbia University, and doctorate from Harvard University. Before joining the faculty at UCLA, Gelvin taught at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Boston College, and Harvard University. He has, not, he has been a fellow of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and a recipient of, of a UC President's Fellowship in Humanities. Dr. Gelvin has written a number of popular books, including his most recent publication, entitled The Arab Uprisings, What Everyone Needs to Know. So please welcome Reza Aslan, Hussein Abish, and James Gelvin. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I feel like crooning. I'm Jim Gelvin, that's G-E-L-V-I-N, for anybody from Campus Watch out there. <laughs> Since I teach history, what I want to do is I want to give some historical background to uh, the debate that's going to take place this evening. Uh, the historical background I want to do rather briefly, uh, because I realize that nobody came here to hear me, they came here to hear our speakers. What I want to do, though, is just lay out a framework in which this debate arose. And that framework begins in 1993, and the other significant date, since I am a historian, is 2000. 1993, of course, was the year of Oslo, which pretty much changed everything. Think about how Oslo was set up as opposed to the way the previous major conference had been set up, uh, the Madrid conference. There was Palestinians uh, were part of the conference as part of the Jordanian delegation. There were all the Arab states and still being viewed as an Arab-Israeli conflict. What Os Oslo did was it transformed the nature of the de de debate from an Arab-Israeli conflict in uh, into a Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Two aspects of Oslo are important. The first one was the mutual recognitions that the Palestinians and the Israelis exchanged. Those mutual uh, uh, recognitions was that the uh, Palestinians recognized sovereignty of Israel. The Israelis recognized a Palestinian nation, not a Palestinian state, but a Palestinian nation, and with the uh, PLO as the interlocutor for that Palestinian nation. Second part of the Oslo Agreement was uh, a beginning of a roadmap for how things would uh, uh, work their way through the uh, negotiations ultimately leading up, it was believed, to a two-state solution. Okay? After Oslo, you had a series of conferences that took place, mostly mediated by the United States, some of which were significant and real, like Camp David, some of which were uh, wheel-spinning, like the Y River Agreement. Um, overall, uh, the uh, process kept on going until the year 2000 or so. 
at which the process pretty much broke down completely. The process kept on going until 2000, but in the year 2000 was the year in which Ariel Sharon paid his visit to the Temple Mount, at which point the Second Intifada broke out, the Second Intifada, which was far more uh, uh, violent than the first one, about 300 to 400 Israelis were killed in the Second Intifada, and pretty much soured many Israelis, in particular on the idea of reaching an agreement with the Palestinians. Since 2000, there have been several developments, one of which has been uh, the uh, emergence of unilateralism on the Israeli side, and then ultimately unilateralism on the Palestinian side. The Israelis basically in 2000 began to pretty much draw their border by uh, uh, building the separation barrier and by also uh, by withdrawing from Gaza. There was still a series of negotiations that were taking place, the, uh, mostly done to appease the United States, but it's fairly evident that the Israelis were not committed to the peace process anymore, and the Palestinians were unable to deliver on the peace process since the Palestinian National Movement was pretty much split starting in about 19, uh, 2007 between the uh, uh, Fatah and the uh, uh, Hamas. The, uh, the Israelis started off with their unilateralism in about 2000, as I said, but ultimately what we're working on now is a set, different type of unilateralism that has been begun on the part of the Palestinians, demonstrating the fact that both sides have pretty much given up on the idea or have at least using the uh, idea of negotiations as in, in itself a negotiating ploy. Uh, the Palestinians, of course, in September of this year, submitted a bid to the United Nations for the recognition of Palestinian sovereignty. Now, where does this come in terms of the two-state solution or the one-state solution? <clears throat> Fairly early on, people began advocating for a one-state solution even after Oslo. And the reason for that was, in spite of the fact that Oslo was supposed to lead to a two-state solution, the idea was twofold. People either began advocating for the one-state solution out of optimism, or began advocating for the one-state solution out of sheer pessimism. In terms of optimism, 1993 marked a period in which uh, this was a period of globalization, this was a period in which na nation states were going to just sort of dissolve, this was a period in which uh, Zionism itself as a nationalist ideology was going to go the way of Confederate nationalism as a nationalist ideology, for example. Uh, so on the optimistic side, there was this idea that in the new world order, uh, George H.W. Bush, the real Bush, uh, in his <laughs> words, uh, that the new world order was going to be an order of peace without ideology. And then, of course, peace without ideology meant, of course, that the Israel-Palestine conflict would be easily resolved. Those who uh, approached the one-state solution out of pessimism approached the, uh, the situation from the standpoint of the fact that a negotiated settlement was not in the offing, has not been in the offing for, uh, since 1993, and certainly in the last 12 years got more and more pessimistic about the possibility of that as well. So this is where we are today. Um, and with that, what I want to do is introduce uh, Reza Aslan, um, who will be speaking for the first 15 minutes, presenting the case for a one-state solution. Thank you.